Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about plastics. But the main topic is actually based on several studies, and specifically two major studies, that has recently identified several major adaptations that life has acquired in order to survive in our world filled with plastic pollution. Or how life has adapted to survive in the world of plastics, and basically in the modern world of microplastic pollution. With one of these papers, this one right here, going into a lot of detail about the genetic adaptations and discovering some really shocking facts about how bacteria has adapted to survive and to even thrive in plastic pollution. But let's start here first. This is somewhat related to the older video I made about microplastics that was actually part of a charity, and you can find this video somewhere right there at some point. What you're looking at right here is a map of plastic pollution across the world. With this very, very large chunk you see in the Pacific, usually referred to as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is a very well known and somewhat unexpected phenomenon where because of the circulations of currents around the planet, a tremendously large amount of plastics, and not just microplastics, all sorts of plastics, tend to accumulate in really large patches across various oceans. And this wonderful simulation from NASA, specifically tracking the objects using satellites, shows us how various objects circulate across various oceans on planet Earth. And specifically here, by watching the certain elements circulate, the scientists can now track where most of the plastics will end up eventually. With several major areas, specifically five areas, marked as the potential garbage patch. And the biggest one is in the Pacific. It's roughly around 1.6 million square kilometers in size, which is about 600,000 square miles, and recent studies estimate that it contains nearly 80,000 tons of materials, mostly plastics. But there are obviously other non-plastic objects as well. For example, here's a typical boat. But a lot of these objects float, and because of this they form almost like a raft-like object that basically floats around and sort of stays in the ocean, well, pretty much indefinitely, because a lot of the stuff does not degrade. And so a lot of scientists were quite surprised to discover that a lot of these floating objects have now become a somewhat permanent settlement for a lot of different marine species. For example, different types of amphipods, so shrimp and shrimp-like animals, which usually live on or depend on other animals or other marine species, such as for example hydroids or anemones. With a lot of these species occupying all of these rafts in a very similar manner to, for example, how many of them usually attach themselves to, for example, the bottom of the boat or any other ship, with this example from the paper being a pretty good visual analogy. But what's really unusual about the analysis coming from the paper is actually the kind of species they've discovered in these patches on these plastics. So remember, first of all, these plastics, because they don't really dissolve very well, can actually stay in the ocean for an extremely long time. And so even if they start near the coast somewhere, like I just say, somewhere in Hawaii, they'll eventually make their way across pretty much the entire Pacific and will actually not really dissolve, allowing these animals to survive for a pretty long time. And because of this, a lot of animals, such as, for example, certain shrimp, that are normally coastal and don't really live in open oceans, have actually been discovered living on these patches in essentially open oceans, with the scientists now referring to this type of an animal as neopelagic, meaning that it's a new species living in open oceans. But obviously this is not a new phenomenon. Things like, for example, floating trees or even this coconut right here do have a potential to maybe provide certain uh, small benefit to some sort of a small animal that decides to take residence on or inside this coconut, and will even sort of move it around the planet and possibly help it land on some sort of an island somewhere. But the thing about coconuts and trees is that they do degrade with time and they don't stay in the water permanently. They're organic, so they eventually rot away. Plastic doesn't do that. And so some of these animals have actually survived on these patches for what seems to be a decade now, probably even longer. And as some of the previous papers reported in the past, this type of rafting or this type of an activity is somewhat influential in the species dispersal across the planet. But because of the sheer amount of plastics and a lot of other garbage floating around the oceans, 80,000 tons of it, the amount of these animals and a lot of other species floating around with those objects and using them for both survival and for potential propagation across the planet has now reached a completely new level. Here we're talking about a dramatic increase and a huge influx of this rafting activity across all major oceans in the world. 
And this comes with a bit of a problem. The problem of the invasive species it might actually bring to other oceans. And so here, if we go back to that NASA video, it sort of shows you how some of these patches or some of these materials have a chance to propagate across a very large area. This has a chance to bring certain species to areas where they've never existed. And with some of these species being somewhat invasive, that's a bit of a problem for a lot of different communities around the world. I mean, for example, if you go on Google and type invasive species, you'll find quite a list of different animals or even plants that seem to be invasive in one way or another. With many of them obviously disrupting the local ecosystem to some extent. But it looks like now we have a completely new way for different species to become invasive. And all of this for one simple reason. All of this garbage inside the garbage patch does not really dissolve very well. It seems to stay there almost permanently. Allowing many of these organisms to survive at sea for a very long time. And even creating a semi-permanent ecosystem inside the patch itself. Which by itself is sort of shocking and I guess to some extent really shows you how life can adapt to pretty much anything. And since more and more plastic is being produced pretty much every single year and more of it ends up in the oceans, all of this will only increase in time and will probably become even more influential across the planet. But that's of course just one of the papers. The other paper decided to take approach of microplastics. It decided to take a look at what exactly happens around the planet with all of the microplastics already present everywhere. As I've discussed in that previous video, we know that microplastics can even be found on top of Mount Everest, they can even be found in some of the most remote deserts, and no matter where you go, you'll find microplastics. Even babies that haven't been born yet will have microplastics inside the placenta. And that is a bit scary. But anyway, so microplastics, what's happening with that? Well, because of their ubiquity, because they're pretty much everywhere, the scientists wanted to see how various microorganisms adapted to various microplastics in their environment. And to their surprise, they've discovered that at least one in four different bacteria, at least the ones analyzed in the study, seem to carry at least one enzyme that's already able to dissolve microplastics and to even maybe use them for one reason or another. In other words, the study implies that a lot of bacteria on the planet is actually adapting to survive or to live off microplastics. Okay, that second part is not certain yet, but the first part is definitely there. The bacteria is learning or evolving to break down microplastics. Suggesting, of course, that the microplastic presence on the planet is causing all of the bacteria, both in the water and even in the soil, to actually evolve and create new genes. And to learn that, the scientists analyzed nearly 200 million genes from various samples, with samples collected from various locations and various types of environments around the planet. In the process, discovering 30,000 different enzymes that could break down 10 different types of plastics. And the surprise here is the fact that so many different species seem to already possess these abilities, so many enzymes were already discovered, and all of this was present in completely different habitats, both in water, air, and soil. And in order to discover this, they actually started with some of the bacteria already known to possess these properties, used the enzymes from those bacteria, and then looked for similar genes from other bacteria that seem to be in completely different environments. With bacteria coming from nearly 250 different sites across the planet. But in order to avoid any errors or mistakes, they also compare this, basically as a kind of a control, with the bacteria that's usually found inside a human gut. We know that human gut bacteria is unable to dissolve plastics, and so by comparing the enzymes from this, they were able to identify nearly 12,000 new enzymes from ocean samples, with many of the bacteria that's really good at dissolving plastics found deeper in the water. But interestingly, 18,000 of different enzymes were also found in different bacteria living inside soil. Suggesting, of course, that a lot of the bacteria that lives in the soil is even better at dissolving various plastics and have more enzymes to work with. And that's also probably because there is just more plastics that is generally found in various soils across the planet. With the majority of enzymes and genes identified being completely new to science, never before seen, never before analyzed by anyone. Which, to some extent, is a positive discovery. We know that life is adapting to microplastics. But its effects, and its long-term effects specifically, are obviously not known to us. Nobody knows where any of this goes, or what happens to life in the next few decades. 
Although obviously both of these studies clearly show that life is just really good at adapting no matter what happens to our planet. Or at least other life. When it comes to humans, we do tend to be kind of conservative. And so anyway, both studies are as always in the description below. These are really interesting discoveries and we'll definitely talk more about this in some of the future videos as more discoveries about plastics and microplastics come out in new studies. On that note, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves to learn about science, maybe come back tomorrow and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.